Well, good afternoon. Thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon for the fourth in our five-part fall webinar series. My name is Jessica DeGraff, and I'm the Director of Retail Accounts here at Proven Winners. And our role at Proven Winners is really to support our independent garden center customers with key marketing programs and tools that help you to not only engage and connect with your consumers, but to better drive those consumers to your garden center as a source for Proven Winners products. So today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, um, customer service. And we're going to be talking with Ann Obarski. But before we get started, I wanted to walk through just a few housekeeping items with you. So first and foremost, all attendees are going to be in listen only mode. That said, we absolutely love your interaction. And there's a couple different ways that you can communicate with us. You can either click the chat or the Q&A icon on your toolbar below. <clears throat> Another thing that I wanted to mention is this webinar is going to be recorded. Anne is going to be bringing a lot of great information. We know that many of you would love to join us um, and to learn more and, and to tune back in later to go through the webinar. So the recording will be available early next week. Uh, but before we get going, I wanted to just talk a little bit about Anne and the goal of our fall webinar series. And that's really to help you to connect with top industry consultants and to learn about some of those key things that are really affecting your business. So Anne Obarski from Merchandise Concepts is joining us to talk about customer service and really how you slip into your customer's shoes and take a critical look at your business. More specifically, your marketing uh, practices and staff performance to help you to ensure that you're delivering on that brand promise each and every day. I know that some of you have, have met Anne before with our spring webinar series, uh, but I just, I really encourage you to dig in, make sure you've got your notes handy because Anne is going to be bringing a ton of great information today. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Anne. Thank you so much, Jessica, for inviting me back. And welcome to everyone who is on the webinar. As she said, we have a lot to do, and I hope you have old school uh, paper, pencil, whatever, because I will be asking you to do a lot of things that will help you out for your business. Today's presentation is called If the Shoe Fits. And I think that we have all been in a situation at some point in the past when we've had this happen, have we not? Today, I'm going to be asking you to walk in your customer's shoes. I want you to turn it around a little bit, do a 180 and start thinking about the journey that they take every day. Now, some of us know that if we've ever done this before, we've either worked out with a pair of new shoes or we've had those pretty girl shoes that we thought were gonna be really comfortable and it just didn't happen. And all of a sudden we ended up with what? Blisters on our feet. And so that that in itself is not certainly not a good thing. And it causes pain. But in a lot of cases, we still wear them during that time because we want to make sure that um, either these new shoes get broken in uh, and or we overlook that there is some pain there. Now, that may be the only pain that you feel on that one. But how about something like this? You know, in our with our customers, we may say, you know, this is just the way we are and you're going to work with us. And so it's a hard fit. But because we love our retailers so much, we go and shop with them. But sometimes it's really, really hard. Maybe we don't like the people that work there. Maybe it's very far drive for us, whatever it is. Walking in their shoes is tough. But in, in this case, you know, it, it was hard to put up with maybe some of the things that hurt. And in this last one, I take a look at all these different kinds of shoes. And if I ask you today, what do you have on your feet right now? Well, if some of you are in your office, maybe you have a pair of tennies on that, that have seen better days. And maybe, uh, maybe you're sitting in your office at home and maybe you've got slippers on and maybe you've got bare feet. I don't know. All I know is that walking the way our customers do throughout our businesses is going to give us some ideas of what we can do better. And I'm going to have you putting on their shoes today. If you will see on this, uh, uh, I guess we're just going to call it a graphic for better terms. Um, this graphic I happen to have made and I have put nine different bubbles all the way around the center part. Those bubbles represent what we call touch points or 
if you even want to look further into this, there's really a business buzzword for these, and it's called a dashboard. And all companies, all companies, not just yours, are very concerned of the touch points, those interactions that we have with our customers and our clients on a day-to-day basis. Now, I have put up nine of these and I've named them. Naming them basic ones that everybody has, but there are also big companies out there that say, you know, Ann, we have about 150 different touch points with our customers. And we're talking about very, very, very large companies. And they could just explode this whole graphic. But for us today, I want us just to look at these nine. They all have, I they all have names that you would know. Your store, your invoicing, your phone, media, marketing, events, social media, sales, and referrals or your social group. But the one area that really ties these bubbles together is the big one in the center. And that big one in the center is customer touch points. So how does your customer relate to you on all of those bubbles that go all the way around? And the center words are extremely important because those center words give us the topics of know, like, trust, try, buy, repeat. And that middle one that I started out with is the word refer. So if I get to know you, if I get to like you, if I get to trust you, hopefully those three, then I will try your product, try your service, try your company. I will do that by buying from you. And then the all important one is we need people coming back, right? We need people to repeat that process. And in that process, we want to have them refer. Now, one of the things that Jessica did not say when she introduced me was that my tagline for a long time, I've been in business 37 years. So my tagline has been to be contagious on purpose. Well, that might make some of you laugh. And why? Because the last year, we haven't liked the word contagious. I've even had people say to me, you know what, Ann? You might consider changing that. And I was kind of offended because that's my tagline. That's what I'm known for. I'm known for working with companies to help you make your business contagious on purpose in a good way so that people talk about you, they recommend you, they refer you, they can be your best cheerleaders, they can be your best marketers because they've built that relationship of know, like, trust, try, buy, repeat, and refer. So I'm going to ask you a very important question today, two of them actually. How important is it for you to get the next six months right? Next six months, figure it. That looks like spring to me. That's your big time period. That's when it all comes down and make, makes a difference in your business those next six months. But more than that, what are you going to do today to make sure that that happens? Now, I am going to challenge you today. I'm an ex-college professor. My idea is not a motivational speaker. My idea is let's get down to teaching skills. Let's get down to what can you do and take away from today that is really going to make a difference. And there are going to be three things, three of those bubbles that I chose. Could I have chosen different ones? Absolutely, I could have. But these are three that I feel very strongly about. And because you're going to be walking in the customer's shoes, let me stop and say, for 15 years, I ran what was called a mystery shopping service so that if you wanted to find out exactly what was going on in your business at any given time, we could come up with questions and we could come up with customers, pretend customers-ish, um, that we could have them shop your store, either by phone, by website, by social media, uh, in person to give us feedback of what should be working and what isn't working and what can we work on. So that's what I want you to do today. I want you to be that mystery shopper. I want you to put on those shoes. We're going to go walking and we're going to take a look at the first one, which is your marketing. You know, marketers don't sell products anymore. They sell relationships. And that certainly was very evident in the last 18, 20 months, because we found 
that being one on one with the customer and saying, hey, you can come back, you can come by and pick it up at the store. We we will be safe. We'll be wearing masks. We want to build that relationship. I want to get to know you better. I want to get to know you more as a customer. I want to know what's going on in your life. So we're starting to see evidence that that has been helping in our businesses because frankly, people are excited to get back and see us in person. Are they not? Um, you know, they don't always want to be on uh, on digital. They would like to be in front of you and see you face to face. So this puzzle piece is extremely important because this puzzle piece really has to do with your marketing. And the goal of your marketing is to three things, connect with people. But let me tell you, that second one is extremely important because it's building trust. If I don't trust you, and again, that was in that whole area that we went around. If I don't trust you, not so sure how much I want to buy from you. And the last one is to create a loyal following. We want people following you. We want them following you in many different ways, but we want them to be your major cheerleaders. So I'm going to put up this term marketing channels in the chat right now. Do me a favor because we're, we're, we're going to work from this. I want you to write in the in the chat, like what's your favorite, what's your best performing marketing channel? Is it, and, and if it's social media, is it Instagram? Is it Facebook? Is it your website? Is it um, Twitter? Is it YouTube? Which one of those? Or maybe you say, Anne, I, I really don't do any of those. Um, my my basic one would be I, I have a newsletter uh, or my customers pick up a one sheet that we make every week and it's at the register and and they they take it along with their purchase. Um, maybe you're on TV in your location. Maybe you are actually on old school radio. Maybe that's how people get you right now. Write it into the chat on what your marketing channels are. Do that for me. Do they look like any of these? You know, if we take a look at it and we say, okay, that one on TikTok, we're not still too sure about that. I, I And I'm not either. However, I do know the rest of them. Some of you look at them and you go, and we've got business in this one. We do Facebook. We do these ones. And, and we believe in this as our marketing channels. But here's what I'm going to ask you. This is what, and you know what, if you've got a cell phone and you don't want to wait to get the handout or you didn't get the handout, take a screenshot or write this down really quick because these three questions should be the functioning basis of all of the marketing that you do. And you should be able to ask yourself these questions. Now, mind you, you're in your customer shoes right now. So you're a customer. So as a customer, you should be looking at your own business saying, why does my customer even care about this picture I'm posting on Instagram? What's in it for the customer? And frankly, why should they even believe me, right? So when I look at this, everything needs to have a strategy. I'm going to say that probably another 20 times before this webinar is over. I'm going to say to you, there is a strategy when we are doing any of your marketing. And unfortunately, if most of you put down things that were digital marketing, if I was to ask you 10 years ago or five years ago, you know, how much of it do you do? And a lot of you would go, you know, Ann, we're really not doing much of, you know, that. And, and frankly, it's free. So, you know, if we post a few things on Facebook, <laughs> you know, um, or maybe on our website, that's a big deal. And at that point, you probably on your PL statement had a line item for marketing. And that marketing might have been hard copy marketing. It could have been a newsletter. It could have been even old school phone book for crying out loud. That's going back 25 years. But you had a way to kind of connect with it and know where it fit into your PL statement. Now, a lot of people don't know how much they actually spend on it. So when our customer, your customer, you right now who are fit, sitting in those shoes, when you take a look at marketing and when your customer takes a look at marketing, there are four things that we want to take into consideration in the word marketing. And if you'll notice, they all end in ING. Well, 
I was not an English major. I'm assuming those are verbs, but I think that if it's an ing, it probably means that there needs to be an action taking place. So if your customer is looking at anything that you do for your marketing, any channel, whatever it is, what are they seeing? Are they seeing you everywhere? You're on YouTube, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram. Um, you do live Facebook feeds on your site. Um, they see you on TV, actually. You have a morning show on Saturday mornings where maybe you um, from your garden center appear on the morning news show. Maybe they are seeing you on a billboard. You see, they are seeing you everywhere. And that everywhere maybe gets them thinking, wow, I mean, everywhere I look is this particular garden center. What are they feeling once they saw that marketing? When I, they saw you appeared everywhere, they're feeling like, wow, these guys are really good. And I know I've seen their stuff. I need to make a decision to stop the next time or get off the next exit. I need to stop and see them because you see, that's the doing part. That's the doing part that makes marketing very important part of your business. So much that you really have to take a look at it maybe financially. Take a look at this comment. 37% of financial performance is lost. Look at that word. Everybody say lost. Lost. From strategy to execution. So today, you're on a webinar. You'll listen to a number of things that I say. This is the, what, fourth out of five. We'll get, you know, you've been to these before. So my question is, did you write stuff down? Did you write things down where you said, I'm going to work on that? But better yet, did you take it from hearing it, writing it down to a strategy? And frankly, that strategy must go into execution. Oh, yeah, we were going to do that. We thought about doing that. But you know what, Ann? When I got off the webinar, everything hit the fan. And well, I'll get to it, but I just haven't gotten to it now. That is costing you money, bottom line. It's costing you lost potential financial performance to take an idea, to work it out, to strategize and make sure it happens. So here's a question for you. You might, might want to put this in the chat. And I'm only going to ask you to put the first one in the chat. In the chat, how important is it to know the return on your investment when it comes to marketing? And I'm only going to give you one to five. It's really, I really don't care, Ann. I, I really don't care about my marketing that much. My business is really good. It couldn't be any better. I get it. Your industry is, is on warp speed right now. But I've also been in business, like I said, 37 years, and I have seen ups and downs. So I know eventually it'll happen. How important is it right now? How important is your marketing? One, two, three, four, or five. Now, if you said it was a five, I'm going to ask you then, then how much are you spending on it? Can you tell me right now? Can you say, Ann, wait a second, I'll get out my PL. I can tell you how much we're spending on it. But better yet, can we take it a little bit further? And can you tell me what has been the return on investment? So you, you tell me in the beginning, well, Ann, Facebook really doesn't cost me anything. And I don't really pay for the ads. And I just have a few people that post stuff. Okay, but what are your analytics? Can you go back and take a look at that? Can you take a look at it and said, if I paid $5 more a week to reach more people, what would that return on that investment be? We all can do better at this. The last question on here is how will you address? So if at some point when you were doing this and you put it into the chat that it's very important, I really don't know how much I'm spending on it. I really don't know what my ROI is, but I know we need to do a better job. What are you going to do when you leave here? You're going to see both that last slide and this one appear two more times. This is the, the first of three. And this is called a SWOT analysis. If you've been in business or you've been around anywhere for any length of time, you probably know what this is. If you don't, that's okay. Because all you need to do is take a piece of paper and draw an X in the center of it and write strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And when it comes to your marketing, sit down in a quiet space write these four words down and ask yourself, what are the three strengths we have in our marketing? What are the three weaknesses? What are the three opportunities? And what are the three threats? I work on threes all the time. Everybody does. And if you are having trouble with it, 
get your people together. I have sat down with nursery owners with their staff and we've done this. And I've had the owners go in. I had no idea that they even had a clue that we could do X for our opportunities. And you know what? We're going to do that because now we're all in. We're all in as a team. Everybody feels part of it because now you're taking what your employees have thought and you're going to make it work. So what are you doing when it comes to marketing? And what are you doing, frankly, when it comes to the strategy? And if marketing is going to be your key takeaway from this webinar, put a star next to it or on a piece of paper on your desk, put circle it, do whatever you need to do. And this one will be the number one important one until you get to the next one. And the next one is staff. Now, again, you're wearing the shoes. You're on the other end. You're your customer, not you. So now your customer is taking a look at your staff. Maybe they're thinking of this, this particular slide that says, hey, Lenny, Lenny, you need to come to work. How embarrassing. Can you imagine if you were Lenny and you were like driving in and you were pulling in the parking lot? I mean, seriously. However, how many of us have had a Lenny, right? How many of us have had a Lenny that's working for us that we wish wasn't working for us, right? So we want to make sure that we know now you're playing the, the customer's part, that first, important, first impressions count. In short, you are the company. So if you are the customer right now coming into your driveway for your parking lot, getting out, who are they saying? If you are walking through the garden center and you're out in the plant area, is somebody trying to play jump rope with you with a hose? Uh, not that I've ever had that happen. Um, if you are in the garden center itself, is somebody doing stocking and not even noticing that a customer walked into the store? If you happen to be at the checkout line, um, are you now 10th in line? You see, what are you seeing as a customer? Huh, first impressions. Looks like they should have, <laughs> they should have a little bit more training on customer service. Looks like they should have a few more people. Um, in short, your people must every single day realize that they are the face of the company. I don't know who these lovely ladies are. I don't know the garden center. I stole this picture, stole this picture. But I thought that I love hot pink. So I just thought that they were lovely women. And I thought, gosh, if I went to their garden center, I bet they would be very knowledgeable. I bet they would tell me everything I needed to know. I bet they would be wonderful. Now, I don't know them, right? So I've just met them. However, I'm making the assumption that they are very good communicators, but here's what we know. In our current world right now, 37 billion, that's with a B, dollars is lost yearly due to employee misunderstanding and bad communication. Now, we have gone through a very tough 18 months. We have gone through being meeting face-to-face -to, -face to meeting like this. We have been meeting now text messaging. We've been doing much more of communication that does not involve face-to-face. -face. But what I do know is that we were doing this long before the COVID and we will be doing it long afterwards because communication is one area that constantly needs to be worked on. Because you see, time is what? What? It's money, right? Disengagement in the US costs over $1 trillion in lost productivity. So your garden center employee who you catch out in the garden center on their phone, or if you maybe you have people who do uh, mowing and, and landscaping and you go and see them on property and <clears throat> they're on their phone or they're talking to somebody else or they're texting somebody else, that's lost productivity. And we know that disengagement Get this, 63% of managers are disengaged. What does this disengaged mean? Disengaged means that you come to work, you do the same thing every day. It's okay. I'm in love with it. And so you're not fully engaged every single day with what you do. How does that happen in communication? Well, it happens through hasty communication. I just, I need to get it done fast. Email, just shoot me an email. I'm just going to make the assumption that you 
heard what I said, but I had somebody in one of my audiences a couple weeks ago who said to me, came up to me afterwards and said, he goes, you know what, Ann? He said, I believe that non-face-to-face communication is the biggest hindrance to our communication process. I agree. I also know it's not, it's not feasible to meet face-to-face all the time. If you are so lucky that your garden center has five or six or 10 different locations, you can't meet with everyone face-to-face. However, making people accountable to having better communication, making sure that maybe it's a two-way process with email so we don't have assumptions is critical. This slide describes you. You're on the other side of this camera right now and I've asked you to be part of it by being the customer. Now, the customer is gonna make decisions when they come into your store about the leadership, but now I want you to kind of step back, take a look at this. There are 10 words on here. Oversee, coach, encourage, influence, inspire, manage, supervise, motivate, mentor, and that middle one is leadership. You see the communication skills, the marketing skills, all of that run underneath your bubble, your bubble of being a good leader. What do you do currently to improve yourself? Because get this, employees don't quit companies, they quit leaders. If I asked you, did you ever have a job that you worked for somebody that you really didn't care for and that you couldn't wait to leave? My guess is it was their lack of soft skills, not their lack of hard skills. They were not good at building relationships. So I'm gonna ask you, you can't do it today. You don't have time to do it today. And I don't want you to cheat and use use the answers that were on that last slide but I want you to theoretically sit down and ask yourself, what are 10 reasons why great people? I didn't say somebody you just hired today. I didn't say lousy people. I didn't say lazy people. I didn't say people we haven't met. I said, why great people, your people, the people who work for you, why should they want to work for you? You know, you can do an exit interview and still get this information. What is it about you as a leader that makes people want to work for you? And what kind of training are you currently doing? As I said, I'm an educator. I know training is important. If I said to you, could you please show me what your training program looks like? Would it only look like an onboarding process after you hire people? Would it be like, this is where you park. This is how you get your check. This is what you do if you're going to be sick. This is the uniform that you're going to wear. And don't steal from me, right? Or... Do we look at people who we have developed and do we say, you know what? You could be a great mentor. I would love for you to be a great mentor for for the business. And I've just hired Jeff and I want you to work with Jeff because you have the mentor capabilities. But I also want you to kind of think about how we're going to cross train. Because frankly, you can be out in the loading dock and you can be either loading mulch or putting new shrubbery on a truck or what have you. And maybe your boss says, hey, I need you inside. We've got 10 people in line and you know how to ring up a sale. You see, that's ongoing learning. I have a friend who runs a uh, large garden center in the Midwest who said to me, and then this is going back probably 10 years, he was paying or spending $50,000 a year on employee training. And some of you just dropped off your chair, you fell off, you went, oh, I, maybe I woke you up. Now you're listening to me going, are you nuts? No, he honestly felt that that training made his employees stay longer. It cut down on the turnover. And frankly, he used to say, I felt that if they ever left me for whatever reason and they went somewhere else, somebody hired them, that person that hired them would say, who the heck trained you? Because you are like my ideal employee. So we're going to look at, these are skills. I could talk about tons of them when we talk about staff, but for me right now, these are necessary skills. They used to be called soft skills. However, I'm going to call them necessary because we need them. Listening skills. Do you listen to hear? Do you listen to respond? Or do you listen so that the person you're talking to said, they heard me, they heard what my problem was, and they cared? Next, be engaged. Remember, I talked about that a few slides ago, but being engaged, being really listening, 
listening with your eyes. I used to say that, um, or I heard it said that if you talk to somebody long enough, looking at them in their eyes so that you can tell the color of their eyes, they might not steal from you. Why? Because you looked like you cared. You were engaged. The next one is to be a problem solver. Being a problem solver is one of the things people come to you for. You're a doctor. You're going to tell them how to make it work, how to make it live, how to make it survive, how to make it beautiful, what to do if it's not. Um, you are a problem solver. But if you're a manager right now and you're on this webinar, my challenge to you is how are you making your employees feel empowered? The biggest buzzword out there these days so that they go, they make a decision. It may not be the decision you made. It's not going to hurt anything. You let them be empowered so that they didn't say the words we all hate to hear. Oh, excuse me. I have to ask my manager. So when it comes to your customer, what is your customer seeing? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And what are they doing when it comes to your staff? That mental thing saying, gosh, they hire the best people. Wow, I can't imagine how knowledgeable these people are. They are, they are an unbelievable uh, garden person. They're certified. And what are they doing saying, I wouldn't go anywhere else but. So let me ask you a question again. What's the return on the investment for your staff. What are you doing to train your staff? How important is it? Again, five, four, three, two, one, put it in the chat. What is the most important thing about your staff? How important is it? And how much are you spending on it? If I looked at your PL statement and I saw training, how much is put in there? How much did you budget for it? Now, mind you, you can budget, but if you don't have a strategy or execution, it's hurting you. So how much are you spending on training right now? You have a boatload of training that you can do with through proven winners. I mean, all of this is just phenomenal for you to use. You don't even have to make it up. And what's the return on the investment? The return on the investment should be one of those things that people stay with you because they love you. They love working with you. They love the, the, the customers. And frankly, they love the peers that they're working with, right? So how will you address this? Can you do it with a SWOT? You bet you can. If you're going to take a, um, a SWOT analysis and you're going to look at the strengths of your staff, the weaknesses of your staff, the opportunities, and those threats. And where can we now drill down, laser focus, which one of these are you going to be working on? So we're going to just stop for a couple of minutes. I'm hoping Jessica's got some questions for us that may have come up in the chat. We're going to be about two minutes. And then we're going to finish up with the last one. We'll ask some questions at the end for you. <clears throat> Thanks, Ann. So real quick question for you. You know, you started, you were talking about the P&L. And so the, the importance of marketing and the importance of training. So in a perfect world, I know, you know, nothing is perfect. What percentage would you allocate or recommend a garden center allocates to both marketing and training? Oh, good question. Well, the first one I can answer because that one I know. The second one I think is is a tougher question because I don't know if, I don't even have the numbers on that, but the first one is about 10 to 11%. Now that number um, has fluctuated with how we've been able to market, whether it's it's um, marketing channels through uh, social media and those type of internet channels versus the other types. But if you put it all together and you put a bow on it, about 10% of your sales. So if you look at it, I would, I would guess most people are not spending that. I would guess that. Um, and when it comes to education, I'm just going to throw it out there and say that most people aren't spending enough. Um, I've been working in the garden center industry probably 17, 18 years. And I know that it's one of the frustrations that a lot of people have. And I wouldn't even know how much they're spending. But a lot of people say, Ann, do you have any idea how many hats I wear? I don't have time for it. But I think we need to readdress it. Great. And then one last question, and we'll let you move on. So Beth was asking, okay, let's say a customer comes in, they're talking to your staff, and they bring a product back that they didn't even buy from you. How do you handle that scenario? It's, is it dead or is it alive? <laughs> um, they probably wouldn't bring you a live one back, would they? Um, well, I could always use the ones that we've heard about Nordstrom's, you know, years and years and years ago, people would bring back a tire to Nordstrom and they go, we don't even sell tires. They go, we'll take it back. 
Um, in the in the scheme of things, you know, I, I think life is too short. I take it back and I just move on. Um, you write it out of stock. You should be doing that on any given um, any given time as far as your inventory is concerned. But more than that, I would start on asking questions. You know, leaders ask good questions and then they listen. So um, let me think. I'm not exactly sure that's ours, but tell me a little bit more what happened. So I'm going to dig deep. I'm going to ask questions because that person probably knew that they didn't buy it from you. But now you're not going to go, oh, well, we can't take that back. That isn't ours. It doesn't have the tag on it. Now you're going to listen a little bit more. And you're and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit so that maybe I'll give you some ideas to use with a customer. But I, I don't think that we help anything by saying, no, we won't take it back. But having said that, there are some people that brutalize the system. And if you have somebody that comes back weekly that does this, then it gets to be to a point going, our store policy is we can give you... I can give you a store credit or I can um, I can take it back this one time. Make sure you look at your employee handbook and your your um, policies and procedures so that you know how to handle this. Because you know what, Jessica, I have heard this story countless times, countless times. Yeah, I think opportunity for dialogue, right? If nothing else. You bet. You bet. OK, well, I'll let you keep moving on in and, and we'll keep compiling questions as you walk through. All right. Sounds good. All right. We don't have much more time, so we're going to get to step three. This is the service experience. My business, I have been known customer service. I consider myself a, I don't know if I'm an expert, but I sure, I sure would like to think I am um, because doing as long as I have, I've also found that it's, it's elusive. We have such a hard time making sure we get it all to fit. And I want to talk about an area that probably you haven't heard anybody else talk about the, on these webinars. And we're going to hit it today because I'm going to talk about women today and, and how it fits into customer service experience and that customer experience. Women make 85% of buying decisions. If I asked you right now, tell me what percentage in any given day are that shop in your garden center or women that call your service business or women that, that you would consider your best customers or clients. Because here's what we do know. Research has shown that women control $20 trillion in global spending and they don't only buy shoes um, and that women buy one in five homes. Now, I don't have in front of me the actual statistics of how many single women buy one in five homes. However, that number had been going up for many reasons. I've got a single woman who has just purchased a home. She sure as heck wants her home to look beautiful and gorgeous. She knows this. All right. So if we take a look at looking at your business through a woman's eyes, why do we say that? Well, we say that because women are really judging, scoring other companies that they do business with. They could be judging their local grocery store, their um, eyeglass store. Maybe it's um, a hairdresser. They are judging everything that they see. And why? Because she has expectations. She wants you to be easy to find and contact. Now that could be, think about it, that could be easy to find in contact if she walks into your store. But let's take it on the flip side. She wants you to be easy to find in contact on social media, in her local community. She wants you to be there where she can find you. Next, she wants you to recognize that she has a budget. She also wants her time with you to be professional and safe. That has changed in, well, I really question whether that's changed in the last 18 months. We've just heard more. She doesn't want you to waste her time or money, but this is a key one. She wants you to sell to her senses and emotions. When I stop into my garden center, I buy out of emotion. I go in there and I just bought the most gorgeous hot pink poinsettia that was the most unusual looking one that my garden center said that they were selling um, to for breast cancer. Did I need one in October? No. I bought it because I loved it. I, my emotionally, I wanted it. My senses said, Ann, you need this in your home. 
I bought it because those last two were important. And what else is she watching? She's watching and being on Instagram and Pinterest. These are two areas for any woman who's on this right now, probably just rolled their eyes because these are two areas that we are never feel like we're good enough. We're never good enough on Instagram. We never look good enough. We never have the better family. Our kids aren't as, as gorgeous. And Pinterest, well, forget it. You know, I, I, I just can't do all the stuff that people do on that. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say, hey, what do you do to paint a picture for your customer? How do you make sell that sizzle? Because you see, they sold, they saw that sizzle on DIY, HGTV, House Hunters, Yard Crashers. They saw that sizzle. They said to their husband, honey, can we do our yard over the weekend? Because that's what I saw them do on Yard Crashers, right? But we also know that there's some ways to get our customers to come back to us, even when something goes wrong. Now, if I showed, when I show you this, how many of you know what it's like to hold a water balloon, right? So there's water in there and that looks like a billiard table. And probably right now you say, and I will choke you if you cut that balloon and it goes all over my, my billiard table. However, it doesn't take much, does it? Website that doesn't come up fast, maybe something you posted on Instagram I didn't like, Maybe it was something happened in your store. Something happened and it happened in a nanosecond. What do we do? And what Beth had said, what do we do when somebody comes in and they're upset and we want to get them to kind of like pull down their anger. We want to, to work with them. And here, I'm going to stop right here and say, and you know what? This exact same thing that I'm going to talk about will work for you as a manager with your employees. When somebody's not happy, when somebody's got their feeling hurt, when something gets said that shouldn't have gotten said, use Tom Hopkins, an old sales guy, guru, who came up with three things, and I added two more. He said, we want to say back to that person, leader to employee, employee to customer. I know exactly how you feel. Again, empathy. One of the biggest buzzwords out there with leadership is what's your emotional quotient? What's your EI, emotional feeling? How do, you, how do you tap in to empathy? I know how you feel. Second, I found that way. I felt that way before. I had a plant that was just like that. And you know what? I found that I just overwatered it. I killed it with love. But here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to fix it. I, manager, I'm going to give you a new one, even though you didn't buy it here. I'm going to give you a new one. And would you give me your text? Can I text you? Would you give me your cell phone? Can I get back in touch with you? Because I want to follow up and I want to know how this old plant's doing. Because you see, I want it to be happy. I want you to be happy. But in a garden center, people want to be successful. Yes? Yes. They, that's, the, the, that's the whole key. However, all of these could certainly work if you have an employee that is maybe having a tough time. So when it comes to customer service and your service experience and your customer, what is your customer thinking, seeing, feeling, and doing when it comes to your service experience? Are they saying, I can't believe they took that plant back. Now it just dawns on me. I didn't get it here. I got it at one of those box stores, right? Um, and what are they thinking? These people were absolutely wonderful. And they actually gave me one back. And I'm not going to go to that silly box store. Again. I'm, I'm going to go to these guys because look what they did for me in my service experience, right? We can move that around to any, any kind of example you want. But when it comes down to it, Jessica, I do not have a percentage on this one, but you probably all know me well enough to know that everything that you do all pulled together should really fade into this return on investment for your experience, your customer service experience. So how important is it? I'm going to tell you, you better put a five in the chat because your customer experience is extremely important. And how much are you spending on it? How are you finding out what your customers think? Are you doing a mystery shop? Are you asking people on a survey? Are you talking to your employees weekly? What are you hearing? What are you scuttlebutt? What is the feedback? What are you hearing people saying in the aisles? And last, what's the return on the investment? Because ladies and gentlemen, the return on your investment for service is where your repeat and referral business comes from. And so where are the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats when it comes to your 
customer service experience. What are your strengths? We couldn't be any better with our, with our employees. What are the threats? We've got two new companies that are moving in within our community. What are the weaknesses? Well, start filling it in. Ask yourself, what is the strategy that we're gonna do? Because here are those yellow bubbles again. Social group referrals, office, what's your store look like? What's your billing, invoicing? Put something different in there. How do people answer the phone? What's a phone, right? Oh, I, thought, I didn't know it did that. Media, what are you doing with the media? Marketing, we already talked about marketing. You're coming up on a time frame right now that I guarantee you're going to be doing holiday events. Social media, what's your social media look like? There's that staff and sales. We didn't even cover how do you motivate and do give your, your employees more key ways to do and be a better salesperson. And the last one, social groups. Because frankly, we want to refer, but we want to know you. I want to like you first. I want to trust you. I want to try from you. I want to buy. And frankly, I, just, I don't want to go and look at anybody else. I want to continually do it. I love this quote. Use it. <clears throat> it's from Bridget Brennan from her book called Winning Her Business. Every customer is like a miracle. Out of all the things that they could be doing that day, out of all the places that they could be, out of all the companies, out of all the nursery and garden centers, out of all those fun places that they could come and buy from, they're buying from you. They're buying from you. So we want to be on a mission. I want you to tap your feet right now. We got happy feet, right? I want you to be on that mission of having happy feet, having that journey that doesn't hurt, having that journey that doesn't cause, you know, cause pain. Um, and I, I hate the ones where it's, it's painful, but I go there anyway. How many of us have gone to a place to do business and we go, I will never shop here again. I will never shop here again. And you find yourself going in there and you go, oh, it's just because they're right around the corner, but I don't like them right? We don't want that. We want happy feet dancing into your business. Just keep on dancing. That's what we want. So it's been my pleasure. I'm Ann Obarski. Name of my company is Merchandise Concepts. You can find me on a lot of places on the web. Jessica, we're going to open it up for a few more questions before we call this a wrap. Right. Well, thank you, Anne. So I actually have a question for you. And I love that you were talking about service because I think that is bar none, the most important thing that we can do. So let's say your garden center has created an amazing, an amazing experience for the customer, right? How do we get that customer to give us a, a, a five-star review on, on Google, right? Or in some of these other platforms, because you want to translate that experience to, you want them to talk to other people. So do you have any tips for that? Well, I still think one of the, the best ways, especially on social media, is would you go post something? You know, would you post it on Facebook? Would you post it on Instagram? Would you take a screenshot of that? Would you bring in, would you bring a picture in so we could start posting it? You know, old school pictures, if we could do it. I mean, I take screenshots and run it through my printer for crying out loud. And having that at your wrap desk or where people check out, just pictures of somebody just redid their, their backyard um, this year and we helped design and we helped make it happen. And this is what it looks like. Um, we are all visual learners for the most part. That's why YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest are all so important because we're visual learners. So having somebody take that extra step we know is not easy of asking them, hey, the next time, would you please post this or would you give us this? We know we've been to stores that do that. So I think that the, that the whole key is even if you can take a picture, uh, say, of a person, do you have a picture on your phone? Can I post that somewhere? Can I put it on our website? Can I put it in our store? Successful customers of 2021 summer, can I put you up there? Because having that ability um, to... Uh, market themselves and say, that was my house. That was my store. That was my front porch. That was my gorgeous uh, pot that I brought in. I think that that helps people um, want to go on social media and write those good posts because that's what we need. We need them on Yelp. We need them everywhere we can. And here's what we all know is that people who are angry are more than likely to put nasty things, you know, and 
one of my favorite places is called Next Door. If you live in an urban area in which you have Next Door and that person and you say, would you mind posting you know, about us on Next Door? People will come to you much more if they said, hey, you know what? I just read about you guys on Next Door. I, my neighbor just said that you were wonderful and I'm not looking anywhere else because I believe my neighbor. So I think it's word of mouth. I don't know if that answered your question correctly, but I think we have to get very creative on how we ask people to give us feedback. Yeah, I, I love it, Anne. I think that's great. So I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit. Shirley was asking the question as we start looking at hiring and staff is, do you have any advice for, for garden centers that are hiring staff for the first time? Oh, yes, because that is probably right now one of the toughest things to do. We all know that people say, you know, nobody's coming back to work and so forth. I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to keep it short and um, maybe two or three ideas. One, if you, I, that sounded like they don't even have staff, but if you even have one staff, asking your one staff member, who do you know? Um, because good people usually hang with good people. So if you know somebody, who do you know at church? Who do you know, um, you know, in school? Who do you know that, you know, um, you play basketball with or you're on a soccer team with or whatever? Who do you know? And I'm using young people because that's what we hire a lot of. So who do we know that way? The second thing that I would say is also asking those people who are in competitive sports or um, especially if you've got high school kids or in a marching band or in theater, why? Because those kids and those people who have any of that background even 10 years ago are much more apt to have better communication skills because they've had to have that. So finding out what did you do before? Two other ways I'm gonna say is that one, if anybody who has been a veteran, veterans are great people to um, be able to hire uh, and those are the people that you can count on that will be able to come in and do good work for you. And probably another place is also people who have worked fast food restaurants. If you can find anybody, I always say the worst thing you ever want to be in is panic hiring. So filling the funnel all, all along, all year long of just putting somebody in there. Maybe they're not ready this time. Maybe they're working for somebody else. But at some point, you're going to be able to hire them. And the last one, and a lot of people don't know about this one, is called a workforce board. Um, all states have a workforce board. If you are in a larger community, a larger city, look it up. They're not always that terminology, but there's something close there. And you can, uh, you can mark it. You can uh, actually post job postings there. And those people actually are known for training. They give training programs to the people that, that they are actually sending out there for jobs. And it's free. Government pays for it. You don't have to pay for it at all. And you can have that coming in, that funnel coming in all the time. And maybe just, just up in your game as far as how to, um, how to interview, because most of us on this call are not HR people. We don't know how to do that correctly. So having that ongoing funnel feeding in from many different places is a big help. Great. I think those are those are great answers. And, and one last quick question for you, Anne. I know you mentioned, you know, looking at the garden center from the female perspective, right? That woman that she's walking in and she's looking at it from, um, you know, play and, and really um, focus on her emotions and her senses. So if you had to give garden centers three points, you know, a, a quick bulleted list of if you're walking through your store, here are the three things you should look at from that female perspective. What would those three things be? Oh, wow. Jessica, three, huh? <laughs> or two um, or one. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, color is extremely important. And I don't care if you're doing fertilizer or potting soil is color and making it into a triangle shape almost so that it starts from almost the waist up with merchandising from your shoulders to your knees so that you are creating a stopping point because think about it, I'm going into a grocery store. The very first place most have that you look is produce. Why is produce so pretty? Because of the color, because of the smell. How is it, how are you uh, merchandising it? From the waist up, right, pretty much. And so you are seeing that, you're seeing signing. So I am saying that each vignette, everything that you stop and look at is like the end cap 
on an aisle in your garden center. It is saying, make me stop, make me look, make me look from the top to the bottom, keep it colorful and make it make a statement. Everything that you do needs to make a statement. If you've got 20 poinsettias and you put them almost in a, in a tree-like shape, you only have 20 and they're hot pink, I got news for you. It will make a statement. She will stop. If you have 20 bags of potting soil and they are all one particular color and you've got, um, you've got different heights and levels, and then maybe you have a little pot um, that's sitting there overflowing with dirt, she's going to stop and she's going to look at it. We like to make statements. When you are splattered throughout your garden center, it doesn't tell a story. So you want to take your customer on a journey around your store by making little vignettes that she stops and takes a look at. I'm, I'm, if you don't have Target in your area, go look at Target. Nobody does merchandising better than Target. Go into Target and ask yourself on the very front right corner, what is it that they have? They got those stupid little dollar, three dollar things. And we all stop there and we go, I don't need anything. But you're like, my buggy won't go past because I got to stop there. And it's meant to be there. You know why? Because the first area that is in the right part of your store when you walk in should be the highest gross margin, highest turnover item. That's why produce is in there in a grocery store. So if you're walking in your front door of your right now, what's in the top, what's in the first right hand area should be your number one top turnover gross margin item that you own, because that's the first thing that the customer sees and make it make a statement and make that customer go, oh, wow, I have to take a look. Those are great answers. And, you know, here's just a, a plug. Anne actually did a really great webinar for us this past spring on merchandising. And so some of those topics you actually brought up in that in that webinar. So we'll make sure that that recording is also available because I think that's great, great information. And, and we sincerely thank you for your time today, for sharing of your knowledge. Um, for those of you that have joined us, I will be sending out a follow-up email with the webinar recording. I'll also send out the notes that Anne sent out and also a link to the recording from this past spring because the information that Anne provides is certainly extremely, extremely good. Last but not least, I wanted to mention we have one last webinar yet this fall with John Kennedy. So he'll be wrapping up his culture series and he'll be talking about creating a culture of engagement. So that'll be on Thursday, November 18th. You guys can sign up on the Proven Winners website. And with that, we just wanted to sincerely thank you for your time and your business. Um, and, and thank Ann. That was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Hope everybody enjoyed.